Hallelujah. Can I help you with something? Could you just remember all that God has done for you and begin to bless the Lord, oh, your soul, and all that is within you? Could you somehow, could you somehow remember and not forget how he daily loads you with benefits, how he was made a sin offering that you might be made righteous? <laughs> so that he was debased so that we might be exalted. Can we just get captivated by his love? Can we get just get captivated by who he is and what he's done? <laughs> Hallelujah. He's amazing, God. Listen, I tell you people, I'm, I'm blessed to be here tonight. I'm blessed to be here with you. And, I, and all I want to do, the only thing I want to do in talking to you is just bring you to a place of a greater commitment, greater consecration, greater surrender, greater worship, greater praise. That's it. That's it. Father, in his love, he's calling us deeper and deeper still. He's calling us into a realm to where that everything about his goodness and everything about his mercy and everything about his love we get to enjoy all day long. Father made us holy so we could behold his holiness. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? Can you imagine what it's going to be like to see what the seraphim see? Listen, can you imagine what it's going to be like to see what the seraphim see and they have to veil their face because it's too exciting to see it? It's more than they can take. It's like, it's like if they look, they're going to die, but they can't die. You know what I'm saying? Can you imagine that? No, but nonetheless, he's made, us he's made us holy so we can behold his holiness and we get so distracted with all of this stuff about us. People, you're going to have to learn how to shut it down and shut it out. Listen, which, that's all this, this is what it's about. You're going to have to learn how to turn away from the distractions. You're going to have to learn how to break through the shame and the discouragement and the condemnation and the confrontations and the hindrances and all the things that would oppose us to try to keep us from embracing what Father has given to us freely. Listen, you think about this. He's made us one with himself, but so few people come to enjoy it because they allow themselves to be strapped and all tied with failure, condemnation, shame, doubt and discouragement and all the rest of the stuff that demon spirits throw at us. In 1,565 years, because God evidently did not put much of a restraint upon the dark world of darkness that Adam let in, in 1,565 years, they completely made man unlike God. They completely made man unlike God so that God said it repents, that I, it repents me that I made man. This is what demon power will do. Let me tell you something. You know when you watch demon power at work, when you watch sin in morality, when you watch immorality, anything ungodly, you're actually watching the effect of a demon spirit operating through another human being. And it produces the same effect then that that demon spirit has taken control over that person. It tries to produce the same effect, whether it's rage, anger, murder, uh, you know, vengeance, the list goes on, and an immorality of all sorts and types. In 1,565 years, there was no restraint upon the darkness that Satan was able to unleash on men because of Adam's sin. Father evidently, and we'll know more about it later, but evidently he restrained that because it's been almost 4,000, it's been over 4,220 years plus. And we have not gotten that bad. We've not gotten as bad as it was. See, you know, the flood was an act of God's mercy to cleanse the earth. Did you know that? Yes. You think, well, you know, it was just judgment. Well, see, yeah, it was a judgment. It was an act of God's mercy to cl cleanse a contaminated earth that had no hope of cure. <laughs> Hear me. Can you imagine what it's going to be? Listen, I tell you right now, listen, people, one of the beautiful things to do is to begin to grab a hold of and start handling the beauty and the splendor and the power and the glory that is in the virtue of God. It's in the purity of God. Listen, the, everything in this world runs counter to that. Everything we see, everything we hear, all the examples, all the model, the education system, the desire, people's ambitions, people want. Everything you know and everything that you've been taught about getting money and getting wealth and getting fame and getting friends and getting stuff, it all runs counter to God's purity. 
his, it, it's, like, it's like how pride and arrogance and greed runs counter to brokenness and humility and lowliness and meekness. It just runs counter to what God is doing. And we've got to understand how to shut off those things and yet still be a people that can go out into a lost and dying world and lay down our lives and be a part of reaching the lost and shining His lights in the midst of a dark and a crooked world. And it's a tough thing to do. You're going to have to get baptized in the Holy Ghost and fire to do it. Listen to me. And in the midst of it all, God's mercy is amazing. In the midst of it all, God's grace is amazing. In the midst of it all, there is the blood of Jesus Christ there washing and cleansing us. In the midst of it all, He's faithful and just to forgive us. In the midst of it all, He's there continually pouring out His grace, immeasurable, eternal, undiminishing mercies new every morning. And people, Satan will get you coming and going. The powers of darkness, the world system, the earthly realms will get you coming and going. It's like if it can't get you one way to get you another way. So you're just going to have to break free and start worshiping God no matter what state you find yourself in. You have to break free, free and start glorying in His, in his goodness. It doesn't take much to get me going. All I got to do is think about the fact that He's redeemed my soul from the grave. He's redeemed my soul from the pet. That He's written in my name in the Lamb's Book of Life. That He esteemed my life better than in His life, so He laid down His life for me. That He, made, he was made a sin offering so that I might be made the righteousness of God. He became a slave that I might be made free. Come on, people. Come on, you're going to have to learn to get emotional about God. You're going, to, you're, going to have to, you're going to have to get your pleasure center all wrapped up in what he's doing. You're going to have to get your pleasure center all wrapped up about on what's going on in heaven or what's going on in the realms of goodness and mercy and truth and purity and virtue. People, I know for a fact this is where the enemy has effectively launched his strategy against the people of God and made them ineffective. Hello. I don't care how messed up you are, God will fix you up. I don't care, care how crooked you are, God will straighten you out. Ah! It just takes a little bit of believing. I'm going to tell you right now, if Jesus can't do it for you, who can? And it's the bottom line of it is, is the church can't really minister it because they don't really believe it. They haven't really got a hold of it. When they get a hold of it, then they can go out and talk to people who know nothing about Jesus, whose lives are all messed up, and they know they can't do anything about it. And they'll, and they'll begin to hear, look, there's one person who can straighten you out, take, change your life, make everything new, take and make the crooked way straight, the rough places smooth. Come on, people. Come on, people. You start, let, you start getting hungry and thirsty for righteousness, you're going to get filled. You start desiring the fear of God that's going to come into your life. You start wanting God to cause you to hate evil, love righteousness, is going to begin to work. You start giving yourself to purity and you're going to find out how wonderful it is. And, and, you're, and what happens is when you want purity, anything that contaminates you becomes exceedingly gross and painful and ugly. But until you start laying hold on what God has given as a free gift, you see, Satan has constantly abused his people and tries to make them think that somehow they're alienated from it. You're not. Christ Jesus made us very near. He's given it to us. And somehow Satan is able to effectively work his work to keep people from desiring what they're supposed to be desiring. When you desire it, God will give it to you. When you hunger for it, he'll feed you with it. When you're thirsty for it, he'll give you the drink of it. I'm glad that he doesn't weary and I'm glad he doesn't faint. I'm glad that he's holy forever. Can you imagine if God woke up tomorrow morning and decided to be a sinner? Could you imagine what it would be like if God woke up tomorrow morning and decided he was going to give his members over to lust and ungodliness? Could you imagine what it would be like if God woke up tomorrow morning as it were and decided, you know what, forget about the whole thing. I'm going to go and pollute myself too. Ah, oh, what chaos. What chaos would unfold. What chaos would unfold. But for all eternity, we can all delight here tonight and that He's holy, 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 and He wants to show us how to be holy too. Ah, oh, we're all good about God being holy and everybody else being holy, so we can whatever, do whatever. Give me a break. You're creating whatever universe you want to live in by the decisions that you make, by the choices that you make. 
I pray that you'll start creating a universe of dance and praise and worship and giving of thanks, of rejoicing God's goodness, of abundant life. I'm going to look at rivers of living water. I'm talking to you about joy unspeakable and full of glory. I'm talking about peace that passes understanding. This means turn the mic up. Hallelujah. He'll tell us a thousand times. He doesn't care. He doesn't faint. He doesn't, he doesn't weary. He'll tell us a thousand times again and again and again and again and again. And as long as we're willing to show up and turn the knobs, he'll tell us again. As long as we're willing to show up and just be there, he's there working with us. Hallelujah. Satan's, hey, listen, Satan's always lying to people saying, give up. My goodness, the only person who ought to be giving up in the equation is God. Come on. What, the, the, the failing guy doesn't give up. The guy who's the loser constantly blowing it, whatever, he doesn't give up. It's the person who's trying to get him straightened out that gives up. It's the teacher that gives up on the student, not the student on the teacher. Huh? Hallelujah. Are you with me? Yes. He never wearies. Never faints. I'm going to step up. I'm going to bust everything that's unlike God. I'm going to bust it. I'm going to smash it. I'm going to break it and see. Come on, man. Get valiant. Just get, start getting hungry and you're going to eat. Start getting thirsty and you're going to drink. Huh? Start getting passionate with the pursuit and you're going to find. God demands it. God demands an ask, seek, knock. I've heard all these sermons on ask, seeking, and knocking. Ask, seeking, and knocking simply means this. It means to demand. It means to demand. It's like the guy in Luke chapter 11 who's begging on the door saying, Get up! Wake up! Man starts getting desperate enough. He starts screaming out to God to wake up. And suddenly they start hearing the Lord speak back saying, You wake up. I've been awake. I'm glad that you now realize that you've been sleeping. And you're alienated from the fact that I'm very awake moving around. Come on, people. Don't make the wrong things important. Come on now. Come on now. Listen, people. You let God teach you how to do everything about your life from the way that you eat and, and drink and, and wear your clothes and sleep and the way you raise your children and the things that you watch and the things that you think about. That's what His Word is there to do, is to transform you, to strengthen you, to empower you, to cause you to be able to think right, to think different. To cause you to begin to shine because a transformation is nothing but a transfiguration. And that's just the, the being lit up power, of, the, the, lit up, the, the lighting up power of the presence of God that was seen on Jesus in the Mount of Transfiguration. It isn't, it isn't anything other than that. It's just what happens to you is you just walk closer, walk into a deeper interaction with the manifest presence. You know what? Yeah, it wasn't too long ago we were in a meeting. My wife is so tired right now. We're so tired right now. We better, we're basically bumping into each other, falling asleep, walking around. <laughs> but her face was glowing in a meeting. I'm telling you right now, it was glowing in the meeting. I was sitting across from a preacher the other night, not too long ago, and this, it, we're having some food, and his face starts glowing. I'm just like thinking, well, you know what? I'm, not, I'm just going to ignore this right now. But can you just imagine what's going to happen? It's a man of God that is, he's every day preaching somewhere. That's why. He's every day. God's using him all over the world. He's in it. He's, he's, not, he's, not, he's not diluted with chasing money. He's not diluted with trying to keep up with this, trying to keep up with that, some other pleasure, some other lust, some other need, some other thing, some other material stuff. People cram spiritual Twinkies. Huh? And what are the other things called? Huh? What are they? Ding dongs into their mouths. <laughs> Hallelujah. Somebody can talk. You know, it's terrible when somebody tries to talk to you and they breathe in. You can't hardly hear that. Have you ever tried that? Tried to say something and breathe in at the same time? The spiritual ding-dongs and Twinkies and stuff to satisfy a pleasure center that belongs to something so temporal. Oh, my, my, my. My, 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 my. At the expense of not knowing how to step into that which is eternal and drink of that which lasts forever. Come on, people. God will bless you. He'll take care of you. He's not going to isolate you and feed you, you know, on, you know, affliction bread and water. <laughs> Make you poor and miserable and cause you to walk around in sackcloth and ashes. But he says, seek me first so that all the other things can be right. 
Otherwise, you're going to have all the other things and they're going to be wrong and they're going to pollute you and they're going to keep you from me and they're going to distort your ability to understand me and your spiritual realm will not be able to connect with me and you'll live more than doubt and faith, more in blindness than in wisdom and insight and revelation. Come on, people. Can you hear God? You're not on his bad list. He's calling all men to repent. He's poured out his spirit upon all flesh, not some flesh. Come on, people. It's time to learn how to fear him before his presence, to tremble at his word. There needs to be a holy fear of God. You know, on the other side, people get arrogant. Get arrogant like Uzziah. Uzziah was getting blessed by God. Uzziah was so getting blessed. He was so getting blessed. Everything he was doing was getting blessed. So one day he decides he's going to go on in the temple of God and he's going to offer incense. He's going to take the priest's place. He's just like, okay, you know, I'm, I'm getting so close to God. I'm just going to, I'm going to go in like my, my great-great-grandfather David and I'm going to act like a priest too. The priest came rushing in and said, you don't belong in here. Get out of here. He's like, who are you to tell the king? At that time, leprosy began to break out on his forehead. And everybody saw it. They rushed him out, and he went rushing out with them. And he lived isolated in a room for the rest of his life because he had no fear of the Lord. He thought he could just run over God's sacred things. God is loving, kindness, full of mercy, but his sacred is sacred. And, he's, and, he, and he wants to unveil all of his holiness. And he's given us holiness and the Holy Spirit and the blood of the Lamb so that we can learn it. But come on, people, yeah. it's still sacred. Yeah. Sacred. And we can become arrogant like Amaziah. Amaziah got to the place where he's like, he's doing pretty good. And then all of a sudden, you know, he starts getting all proud of himself. And, and then he's, and he starts charting his own course. And the prophet of the Lord comes and tells him and tries to warn him. And he says to the prophet of the Lord, who appointed you one of my royal counselors? Like he's in charge. He found out right quickly he wasn't in charge. And you're going to get to act arrogant just so far. God's going to confront us, and he loves it. And I'm telling you right now, the best thing to do is at the confrontation of God, just bow and weep. Just bow and surrender. Hey, don't eat. You know what? My goodness, I believe that at the moment that there's any kind of, any form of sin, any form of transgression, any form of wrongdoing, there's a confrontation with the Holy Ghost. And people can either harden their hearts and they can make excuses for themselves and they can justify it and they can say, well, this is the way it works or whatever. Or they can immediately bow and come to God and there in His loving kindness, He reaches out, He takes hold of us and He starts kissing on us and says, look, let me train you. Come on, let me train you. Let me show you how to do this. Let me show you how to walk perfectly. You know, it's in my heart. It's in my heart. It's in my heart to walk perfectly, but he's my perfecter. And I rely totally on him because I can't do anything. I can't turn to the right or turn to the left. Father got so excited about Solomon that Solomon was smart enough to recognize that he didn't have enough intelligence to turn to the right or to the left in the realms of the spirit. He said, you, you're on it. <laughs> you're on it. And because you didn't walk, because you didn't ask for riches, but you just simply asked for wisdom, I'm not going to only give you wisdom to know how to turn the right and the left. He says, I don't even know my right hand from my left hand. Come on now, listen to me, people. You talk about dependency and reliance upon God to recognize that you, in a, you lost, you don't know where you at. And you need God come rescue you and you need God come help you. Without him, you can do nothing. There, there, things, go a long, things go a long ways. You can be seated. Things go a long ways in the spirit. When we're simply willing to recognize his loving kindness and tender mercy that's there to help us. So Jesus says, without me, you can do nothing. And this is the hardest lesson for people to get. They don't want to get it. People don't want to get it. They run wide open all day long. They make decision after decision without even asking the Lord, without even consulting the Lord. What well, Day after day, day in, day out, doing it on their own, just doing it because this is what they do. Father wants to show us a whole other way. He wants, to, he wants to bring us into enough understanding of relationship with him. I guess Solomon just was around the anointing enough to see how amazing, it, the amazing effect that it had on folks. You know, have you ever run into the scripture where all of a sudden, 400 years later, Obadiah, Obadiah is still around? What happened to him? Somebody said, well, that's got to be another Obadiah. It's Obadiah's house. It's Obadiah where the stuff is. Obedeem still around 400 years later. How could that be? It's an interesting concept, interesting thought. That perhaps because of what was going on when the 
ark was returned. I mean, just think about it. Just, 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 think, just think about it. Just come throw this out because it's a very obscure little passage of scripture that I know very few people have ever noticed it. And people go into their search engines and type it in Obedidum <laughs> now. Okay, I can see this stuff. This is, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. But as the ark is coming back, you know, from being taken by the Philistines because of all the, the stuff that went down and the abuses of that which was sacred. And let me just tell you something else. If you want to see what's happening in the church and the cycle of men, just go back and read the Old Testament and especially First and Second Kings and First and Second uh, Chronicles and First and Second Samuel, especially First and Second Kings and First and Second Chronicles, and you can see a rep repetition. You can go and look in the Judges, and you can see a repetition. You can go and look in the wilderness, and you can see a repetition. And Paul gives us a warning. Hebrews says you better listen up because you're basically going to do the same thing they did unless you grab a hold of something more than they grabbed a hold of. And I'm going to ask you, have you grabbed a hold of something more than they grabbed a hold of? Have you grabbed a hold of something more than they saw in the cloud by, in the cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night and the manna that they that fell right down from heaven's table? Come on, think about it. Of the water that they drank from the rock in the wilderness. I mean, of the glory and the splendor, the majesty, the power of God that they saw over and again as the Spirit of the Lord fell upon the, the tabernacles, uh, Yahweh's there, his presence was enjoyed there. I'm going to tell you, Christ Jesus wants to show us more, and it's all encapsulated in obedience. He says, you obey me. He says, I'll come and ma manifest myself to you. And truly, obedience is the only proper response and legitimate response to God's love. But we've got to find out that, you know what, there's a spirit of obedience that we've got to learn how to rely upon. You know, I watch all these various different traps that Satan gets people in. One of the things is people trying to be something more than what they are. People comparing themselves to others. Listen, I'll tell you right now, if God wants to grab a hold of you and, and take your name and make it great in the earth in a day, that's his business. You know, every one of us are, have the right to go ahead and pursue every dimension of the fullness of the measure of the ministry of Jesus. And for us to have any other response would be illegitimate. It would be wrong. But we then don't, at the end of that, go and compare ourselves with everybody else because we may be James in our ministry and may only last about six months and then we're dead. Are you listening to me? Yeah. You know, you may be Thomas and you go throughout... The whole, of the, the whole of the New Testament in complete obscurity after the Gospels are done. You, you're, it's complete obscurity. Your name's never mentioned. Somebody comes up on the scene after you, has a great revival in Samaria, Philip. And he becomes, as it were, at least a, a bit of a star in chapter 8 and his mention of having one of the great churches of Caesarea later on in the book of Acts where all the great prophets and everybody gathered around had four daughters prophesied and it had been great to be in his church in Caesarea. After he had baptized a eunuch there in Ethiopia, he was, uh, the Ethiopian there in the desert, uh, he was caught away into Joppa by the Spirit. He could talk about that translation event, probably was talking about it most of his ministry. I remember when I got translated. He probably got, I don't know if he ever got translated again, but he got translated once. And he has a great pastoral ministry. Cause then he ends up in Caesarea right after that. You know, you read in the passage, in Joppa to Caesarea. And then many years later, probably 25 years later, he's seen in Caesarea, Paul shows up there all of the great prophets are there my 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 what a place to have been you know people get into this thing of trying to get they get all ambitious with god and they don't and somehow it becomes a rut to them they feel like a loser they haven't accomplished anything they haven't done anything well my goodness are you redeemed by the blood of the lamb have you been called the son of god don't you realize your life is eternal god's got big plans and you're just getting started why are you why are you giving up right at the first why are you making it all about right now? It goes throughout the span of eternity. Give me a break. I mean, you need to get our eyes set a little bit more on a broader view of things. <laughs> I mean, we, 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 we get this little, you know, microscopic vision, tunnel vision of what God's doing. Look, it's, it's far, far beyond all that we can think or ask. It's vast. Yes. 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 Yes, we want to do great things in the kingdom of God. Yes, Father's purpose for us to do great things in the kingdom of God. Yes, I don't believe that there's anybody who, who's left out and that has, you know, somehow less rights than others. But I know people who saw God all their life and they've never left town. But they found a place of intimacy with the Lord and they died in the realms of His glory. And they went up into the reward and something's going on beyond all that we could imagine there. 
Who knows what they're doing now? Who knows what God's long-term plan is for them? Can you understand what I'm trying to tell you? You know, Dake, Dake did Dake's Annotated Bible. What a, what a legacy. And he did, you know, Revelation Expounded. And he did some great, just great works, great works. And he got to see the angel of the Lord and the chariot of the Lord on his front lawn there to pick him up as he was dying. Hey, well, that's great. Reinhard Bunke is able to go have 800,000, almost a million people in his crusades in Nigeria. Well, Chris was able to do 6 million. So now they in competition about who's going to get to seven. I mean, preachers running around. A.A. Allen is trying to outdo Jack Cole. Jack Cole said, well, A.A. Allen just got a bigger tent. I'm going to get even a bigger one. Because he just said on television he had the biggest tent in America. So I'm going to go add another uh, 5,000 square feet to mine. And we just become so ambitious or we become, where we get overwhelmed saying, I'm not doing anything. Well, well, what is it that you want to do? Would you like to see his holiness? Would you like to see him? Would you like to encounter him? Would you get all of your ambitions? Would you get all of your, your desires and your passions and the things that you are longing for and looking for and working for and laboring for to be focused on about on, on the kingdom, about who he is, about the privilege and the opportunity that you and I have to be one with them and walk with them. Boy, these girls need some help. I hate to send them off to the prison called nursery, but it's about, hap it's about getting ready to happen. Is there a good nursery people? Is there good nursery people now taking care of nursery, laying hands on the kids, helping them to be transformed from brats into, you know what I'm saying? Is there, are there people working in the nursery now on Wednesday night? What are they doing? Are they having Holy Ghost meetings there? Or are they handing out uh, crackers and drink? They're watching service. Praise God. You know, people, I, 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 want, I want your kids to stay in church. You're going to have to learn how to get a hold of them. I believe every child, you can get a hold of every child. I believe there's not a child on the planet. I mean, I watch people say, well, my kid's more rebellious than other kids. That's not true. My kid's more self-willed than another. That's not true. You know, it just, it just, you know, the same Holy Ghost works a miracle in every department, every dimension of your life, if you just believe them. Amen. Is there, what area, what area can't God work a miracle in? Huh? Are you listening to me? And somebody said, you know, I'm thinking about marrying so-and-so, but he's sick. Well, I mean, are you in love with him? Yeah. Well, then uh, why would you limit God? I mean, you know, somebody said, well, should I marry him and expect him to be sick all of his life? I, well, I don't believe that that's faith. I mean, I, <laughs> I'm going to marry him. Come on. I mean, where's the miracle? What, do, what part of our life are we going to shut down the miracle or reduce God's miracles in our lives? Oh, she put You know, I get in this situation and, you know, we begin to see things that we want to try to sort everything out and correct everything. And, but it's just impossible to do it. God in his loving kindness is there working with us. He wants to cause us to hear. Sometimes the very simple things in our life need to be corrected or changed. And we're able to then just go into, you know, whole other dimensions of interaction with God. And it really, that's what it's about, people. I just, I, I, I pray in the name of Jesus. Tonight, you'll be able to lay hold on that. Open up your Bible and I want you to look with me in a couple of verses of Scripture. Just God's mercy and God's goodness. I'd like to, I would like to, do communion tonight and so maybe I could get somebody to help me um, most of my helpers are gone and Joshua probably going end up end up going and doing music here uh, so Chris why don't you go over there and and why don't you uh, and why don't you, uh, why don't you help him and Geneva's an expert at it, but she's got babies crawling all over her, too. Thank you, Father. Can you open your Bibles to 1 John chapter 2? Hallelujah. Whew. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I believe that if you and I could just grab a hold of one beautiful thing and just stay in it and, grab, and just live in it, ha. Huh, something wonderful would begin to happen in, in the realms of our thinking and the realms of our relationship and our interaction of what Father has done for us 
through his blood, through the pouring out of the blood of Jesus Christ and the power of it. You know, when you look at 1 John chapter 2, you're looking at it, it says this, it says, if we sin, you see this? Are you there? Yes. Everybody there? It says, if we sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us. Huh? Yes. Look at this. Let me just, let me just look at it. Everybody looking at it? My little children, these things I write unto you that you sin not. And I say this, if you sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Think about this mercy and this grace. Who is the propitiation. He's the offering, the intercessor, the mercy seat. He's the one who takes up our calls for cleansing. He's the one who, he's, he's actually, the scripture says that he finds the value in his life. Finds the value in his life of always praying for us. Or in other words, he forever lives to make intercession for the saints. And he values his, the value of his life. It's like a grandma. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> What's grandma got to do? She, does, she can't go anywhere, so she just prays for everybody, right? And, and the prayers are effective. You think, I love thinking about the uh, Hebrides revival because Hebrides revival was one of the great moves of the Spirit that was literally a revival that, and, and, and I use this word respectfully, but it's true, ushered in by an 82 and an 84-year-old woman who's praying, crying out to God, who gave them their lives to fasting and praying, 82 and 84. Huh? And so God showed them that the revival was come, the date, the man that was to send for, the, the, that he was going to use to deliver the word, and, and where the revival was, and where the different moves of God would take place, and who was going to get saved first, and what would happen as a result of that. And there was this, just this amazing, amazing thing happened. But here we've got Jesus, like almost like grandma, he's, she, he's praying for us, his whole purpose and value and living is to pray for us and make intercession for us. I mean, just think about this, people. We forget about this and all the other events and all the other issues and all the other fill, failures and feelings and sense of worthlessness and, and all the things that we seem... Look, I'm going to tell you right now, I hope everything you do, you fail at. I really, I do, I do. I hope everything that you do, you fell at so that you can learn how to rely on him so that he can make you an eternal success. Because if you start becoming, becoming successful, all you're going to do is be drifting further and further from him because I discovered from the word that before you're ever going to be exalted, you've got to be humbled. And I'm not talking about being exalted among men. Who cares about that? Well, you walk around, everybody thinks you're so smart or whatever. You know, they think you're so wonderful or your voice is great or you're a superstar you know you know whatever i mean come on give me a break i listen exalted exalted means to me that we get to stand and see and behold the glory of the one that sits upon the throne in a way that nobody else gets to see him my father has appointed us and created us and made us as you know paul describes this to judge angels which is an amazing thing how am i gonna you know you think how am i gonna judge a seraphim who's been bailing his eyes forever screaming holy 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 you know are one of the living creatures who who's standing there in the presence of god night and day doesn't rest he's captivated he's like wide open the emotions are absolutely like a, a you know the pedal to the metal it's just wide open you know because of all that he is beholding and the beauty and the splendor that they're seeing. I mean, it's just a limitation in how to express something that we've never been able to observe other than to hear it and see it in the Word and try to imagine what it's like. But it's got to be something like that because it's night and day. And you, I, you know, it's, it's a crazy thing to me hear people say that somehow they think that angels don't have a will, like they're some kind of robots, and all they were they were just created to stand there and go, holy, holy, holy. And that is ridiculous. That is absolutely just debunked theology. Let me help you for a minute. There were angels that sinned. They went and transgressed against God and followed uh, uh, Lucifer will. W-I-L-L, -L, will, ability to choose something different than God chose for you. Now that's settled. I could give you some more proofs, but email me. Nonetheless, they're doing this out of a voluntary reaction and response to what they're able to behold. And Father wants us to behold it too. And there's mind-blinding spirits that want to try to constantly condemn us. I'm going to tell you right now, you get past condemnation, you're going to see miracles, signs, and wonders. You're going to have visitation. You're going to see things going on around you that you didn't even believe could be possible in your life, you're going to be able to step into nations and prophesy to nations. You're going to be able to go beyond all the limitations and restraints that everybody says that you are confined to. 
I'm going to tell you right now, there is therefore now no condemnation. Unless you're misbehaving. There is therefore now no condemnation. And even with, the, and really there, it's not a condemnation as much as it is a conviction unless you persist in it and then it becomes a death penalty. Then it becomes a condemnation. Because a condemnation is to say that you're cut off. A condemnation says, listen, no, there's a judgment on you now. No, I want you to say, I want you to say this, people, because you've got to understand something here. You know, Father, Father's love and His mercy is amazing. It just continues to go on. You can look at uh, disobedient and rebellious, as it were, sons in, in Hebrews chapter 12. What does He do? What does He say? He said, I'm going to chasten you. <laughs> in fact, He says, I'm going to flog you. That's what it, what it says. Huh? He chases every son you know, that He receives and He flogs them. He's on them. He's going to correct us. Praise God, He's going to do it. But, and there's this wonderful faithfulness of God. And he doesn't, he, doesn't, he, doesn't, he doesn't allow us to be tended above what we're able. He doesn't, the correction isn't so severe that we don't see that it's, you know, a proper execution of God's judgment. Here, Father is in his love and his tender mercies. People, he's calling us into a place of where that we can live in a, in a realm of there is now therefore no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Understand, we right now are under, supposed to be under the ministry of righteousness, a culture of righteousness. God is holy, and He made me holy. God is righteous, and He made me righteous. God is almighty, and I worship Him alone. Alone, I'm in Him, and He's in me. I'm in Him, and He's commanded me to be. What a commandment. I command you to be in me. I mean, the Lord says, you know, John 15, 4, he says, if you live my life, I will live in you. What a commandment. I mean, what an obligation. I mean, what a responsibility. I mean, intense, intense. Think about it, people. God's dues, God's dues are so far greater than any of his don'ts. It's like him telling us you can have everything. Just don't touch the one tree. I mean, it's the same way today. And we're just sitting over here fixated on something that we're not supposed to be doing. I mean, give me a break, people. We're supposed to be living in the ministry of righteousness. Hallelujah. Not in the ministry of condemnation. Satan's greatest trick against people, they walk it around, they all depressed in captivity. Listen, if we sin, we have an advocate with the Father. Think, look at it. We have an intercessor. We have one that takes up our cause. We have one that comes to our aid. How does he come to our cause? Come to our aid. Does he go to the Father? Oh, Father, look, please. I mean, come on. Give Joshua a break. He's really not that bad. I know him a little bit better than you do. He's really a very, very nice guy deep down inside. He just like, he gets a little tweaked every once in a while and goes off and does these weird things. No, that's not how he takes up our cause. That's not how he says He stands here with his blood of redemption, with a cleansing power, a flow from heaven that is the means to eliminate the judgment of death that is upon every man that sins. Nothing's changed. People think things have changed in the law of God. Nothing's changed. It said the disobedience of Adam has the same impact. It's the fact that the blood of Jesus Christ is there with the, the, the efficacious, effective, vicacious ability to wash away every sin for every person who trusts him to deal with the death right there on the spot, not just once, but over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. Is that wild or what? Is that an amazing God or what? I mean, you get to start looking. You get to start looking at something to see of His glory right there. It's like, wow, you know, whoa, that is amazing. How can He be that merciful? How can He be that loving? How can He be that forgiving? How can He be that caring? How can He be that tender? How can He be that kind? And that's just scratching the surface of what it looks like to stare at Him. I'd like to stare at Him. I've walked the Holy Ghost long enough to real, come to realize how wonderful purity is, and I want it. I want it. I want it in every dimension of my life. I have it. I've received the purification that comes with the blood of the Lamb. But I, as Peter says now, and he said, look, when I heard Peter say this, when he said in 2 Peter that he was going to give all diligence to stirring them up and keeping them in remembrance, as long as he was in his tabernacle of the things that he had just written there, I thought, 
Wow, if, P if Peter thought that this was his reason for living, to, as long as he was in his tabernacle, to stir them up by putting in remembrance of these things, I'm going to take up that same torch. Because he says, guys, God, by his divine power, according to his divine power, has given us everything that we need for his life and for his godliness because he's called us to walk in his glory and his purity and he's made us, you know, he's made us partakers of his divine nature and we've escaped the corruption that's in the world through lust. In other words, that's the same as to say we're a new creation, old things have passed away, behold, all things are new. It's the same as to say we're a new man created in righteousness and true holiness. It's the same as to say we've been born of the spirit. You know, it, he, he, it, it goes on. I could keep going on with the list because it's just a repetition of that beautiful thing of the washing of water, of regeneration, renewing of the Holy Ghost, all of those various different phrases in the New Testament that describes this miracle of salvation that has been worked on our part so that you and I can walk around with a void and a conscience void of offense, a sense that everything that has been that has been in our life that is that has been a disdain to God that has been completely removed off from us. Listen, any sin that has ever been committed is worthy of death. We were shaped in sin and, and we were we were born in sin and shaped in iniquity. He listened every day of our life, every dimension of our life, and everything that has gone on in our life. If we were held accountable for it, there would not be one person who would escape the eternity, the eternity of a damnation and a, a, a place in hell. And, and what has got us to this place is because we've called upon the name of the Lord Jesus and that same name and that same blood and that same power keeps us to this very moment that if we sin, if, if we sin... Hallelujah. That's how I can understand the context of what John says when he said, he that sins is of the devil. Wait a minute. I understand he that practice sins because practice sins is of the devil because if we sin, huh, we have an advocate that is there. There is a provision and a mercy for those who are right. Understand, there, if you look, you'll begin to see the reality of how the scripture unfails itself. That if we walk in the light as he in the, is in the light. There is a place of walking in wisdom and understanding and revelation and God's love and insight where we're not blinded by the darkness, where we begin to behold His goodness for us and all that He's done for us. Within light, in the, in His light representing His presence and His presence and His light representing His truth. And that declares to us His mercy so that therefore if we walk in the light as He's in the light, then the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us. It's a continual, ongoing cleanses us. My fellowship, my fellowship, my fellowship. People get all upset, man. They stumble up, they trip up, they feel like a failure, they feel discouraged, they feel like they haven't done anything, they feel like somehow they're left out, and now they now they just all wrapped up in the self. They can only worship God when they feel good about themselves. That means you worship God on the terms and the basis of who you are, not on the basis in terms of who He is. It's about time you learn how to worship God on terms of the basis of who He is. And then you're going to find a place of victorious living. Then you'll find the place of the one who overcomes. I find my fellowship. I come right here with all boldness into the blood, into the holies of the holies by the blood of Jesus Christ. I have no worth of value in myself. It's the blood of Jesus Christ that's done it for me in a relation. And that blood has brought me into a place of relationship where I desperately want to know this one who loves me so. Yes. Hello. Yeah. Come on. Satan wants to use all the things around you to steal your praise. Your faults, your failures, your stumblings, your, your hurts, your worries, your concerns. You're not, I watch people get so worried about stuff and then it never happens. <laughs> worried about an event that never takes place. Days in, day out, day in, day out. Worry, worry, thinking it all through. And then all of a sudden they get news. Oh, well, it's not going to take place. All of that time spent worrying for nothing. And in reality, that's your best scenario right there. And all the rest of it, basically, even it does seemingly take place, it was just the same thing. And it could have been changed and different had you prayed instead of worried. But why pray when you can worry? It seems so much more of a use of time in the, in the framework of human thinking. And it takes so much more energy. I'm too tired to pray. I'm going to sit here and worry. It takes so much more energy. It taxes you. It steals your sleep. It robs your joy. It takes your peace away. It's a power and effect of condemnation and shame. And it doesn't bring any honor and glory to Jesus' name. The blood is supposed to be a fellowship and a communion. I said it's supposed to be a fellowship and a communion. I don't, I don't care. Man, when you start having a fellowship and communion, I mean, you might start off looking like this <laughs> with no emotion, but you're going to end up like the seraphim and like the living creature. Ah! 
<laughs> I mean, you know, I, I was, I, 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 one night, I would uh, spare you the story because many of you have heard it, but the Lord showed me this seraphim's worshiping, and there was a reason why, because I was in a fix. I was in the straits of, of, of some challenges at the time about how wild I worship. I, I'm getting older now, I'm 57. I don't do, I'm not quite as wild. Uh, you know, you don't have to peel me off the ceiling at the end of the meeting. But at any rate, you know, I saw the seraphim, and I understood that, th that night when I woke up, that, that next morning I understood what the scripture meant, that with two wings they did fly. Because I, you know, I just like, you know, you, my first picture, I guess, was they were like fluttering, you know, just <laughs> hovering. You know, they're standing there in the presence of the Lord and two wings, they cover their face and two wings are just kind of like, you know, hovering. No, it was aerobatics. It was, it was a complete display of just wild love and emotion and can't, uncontainable response to such pleasure in his presence is fullness of joy. Yes. At his right hand, his pleasures were more. Satan has opened up the door to the wrong pleasure centers, and men are captivated with it. God's got another pleasure center, people. It's the, it's the, it's the, it's the holies of holies. <laughs> it's the throne room of his glory. It's another pleasure center. I'm telling you right now, there's nothing in the human realm that can match it. We're, we're pleading with you. God, the Holy Ghost is pleading with us. He's saying, let me show you. Let me show you how to get involved. Let me bring you into this place. I'm, I don't want you to live like animals. I don't want you to live in like people that are, that are orphaned and the people that are shut out and cast off and, and unclean. I'm, I'm, I'm come and, I, and I've reached down and, and I've brought you up out of the pit and I've washed you from your uncleanness and I'm dressed you with royal priestly garments and put a crown of love and kindness and turn the mercies upon your head and, <laughs> and I'm there for you always there on your side taking up your part and he doesn't leave it there he just keeps layering one thing on one adjective of love and, and, and mercy and goodness upon another and he tells us how that the Holy Spirit is making intercession for us he's there on, on our side in the midst of our weakness in the midst of our inability to understand and think and see clearly if there's anything that you need to understand in your realm of wisdom is you need to understand how to draw a bloodline between you and all that is out there in the world because Satan can create, as it were, momentary insanity. You don't even know what you're doing. But if you draw a line of consecration to God, man, Satan can't come over that line. And when you discover this realm, he can't mess with you in condemnation. He can't mess with you in shame. I mean, you've got a place, a strong defense. There's a place where faith begins to be built up on the inside of you and revelation begins to flow. I'm telling you right now, all the secrets of God belong to the children of God on a need-to-know basis. Listen to me. On a need-to-know basis. In other words, are you, if you're doing something with these things, then you need to know. Huh? If you're off just with your own stuff and concerned about your own stuff and rearranging your peanuts again, I'm going to tell you you're not on a need-to-know basis. Organizing your walnuts and organizing your other pecans and organizing your, your, your uh, uh, whatever else, acorns, like a little squirrel storing up for the winter. Are you listening to me? Stand in your stuff. <sighs> Papa tries our hearts, and I know that I, in my own life, what I want to see me getting, getting excited about is his house and his stuff and his things. I don't want him seeing me getting all excited about this other stuff, and then it comes time to go to church, and I'm all sour-faced. I'm all bummed out and beaten down, <laughs> dragging around, saying, man, we got to go to church again tonight, and they're probably going to want an offering. I, was gonna go, I wanted to go spend some money on myself. Are you listening to me? I don't want Baba seeing that in me. I don't, no, no, no. Not one response. You know, there's times that the thoughts that go through our head or actions that go through or, or, or begin to start to take place and, and the Holy Spirit are just because He's there loving us and growing us up in matureness and He'll show us how profane it is and how wrong it is. And immediately what we're supposed to do is say that is profane and wrong. And I sit there and all of a sudden begin to beat ourselves up. Yeah, I'm a loser. I'm an idiot. Yeah, you know, I'm just, I must be, you know, I must be a child of Cain. <laughs> or whatever. <laughs> 
crazy ideas that people come up with. I, I, I must have blasphemed the Holy Ghost. These crazy ideas that Satan is able to run in the Just get your dive into the cup. I mean, dive into the cup. I mean, I'm talking about this cup of communion. Dive into the cup. Just swim around in the cup and the blood of the communion. Just dive in. Just swim around and float in the cup and live in the cup. And just everything you know is I've been washed in the blood. My garments are spotless, shade, whiter than snow. Blood, the blood, the blood. Oh, the cleansing blood. Oh, the cleansing Oh, the cleansing blood. Hear me. Hear me. This is the ministry of righteousness. It's not supposed to be a culture or ministry of condemnation. It's supposed to be a culture and ministry and mindset of righteousness. Oh, the blood. Oh, the precious blood of Jesus. Think about it, dear people. Think about what his blood has done, how he's washed us whiter than snow, that we're st stained with a crimson stain, a double crim dyed crimson stain, red with murderous hate and treason against God, man. They took it and washed it all away. Oh, the blood. Father could have redeemed us with gold and silver. He could, he could have bought us with the universe, if you could imagine that. But he bought us with something of higher price, more valuable, more pricey steel. With his own precious blood, his life given in judgment for us. It's more than just a, it's more than vicarious offering. It's more than a substitutionary offering. It's more than the offering that the lamb tried to represent. It's more than the offering that the bull tried to represent. It's more than the offering that the red heifer tried to represent. It, it is an offering where his where the power of his very life swallows up death, comes upon us and makes in us something that goes beyond what we can imagine as the new creation and then vicariously works almost as though it was an immune system, a divine immune system, fighting off all the virus and the plagues and the bacteria and the disease that would assail us. Ah, and it works good. We might get a little, sn little snotty nose, as they say, for a a day or two, but huh, the immune system's powerful. Hallelujah. Look at you. Look at you. You're still here. Just imagine if you would have smiled all the way to here. Just imagine if you would have praised all the way to here. Huh. Just imagine if you would have shouted all the way. No matter if you just had a good time all the way here. Instead of all of the chaos and all the concern and all the worry and all the fuss and all the fight and all the fear and all the turmoil. Well, after such a long time as this, why don't we just go ahead, go ahead and end all that mess? Yes. Why don't we just go ahead and end all that mess and give ourselves over to walking in this covenant, this place of fellowship. This is the communion. This is the communion. It's something that is said before us and God said set it before them so they can get it. This is it. This is it. This is the communion. This is the access that you have into my presence. This is it. This is your worth. This is your value. This is what brought you. This is what has purchased you. Having begun now by this is how you perfected. <laughs> this is the fellowship over here. Hallelujah. If I'm the only one that's going to shout in a place, that's okay. You just learn how to dance more and you'll shout more too. You learn how to rejoice more and get excited about God with your emotions and your emotions will begin to be caught up in Him instead of caught up in everything else. You begin to allow Him to be your pleasure center and all of a sudden those other pleasure centers won't be able to grab you. The demonic stronghold is a powerful claw that reaches into your soul to claim it for the jaws of hell for eternity. And only the blood can break its power and the blood is power to break it. Satan can't stand against the blood. He can't cross the bloodline. He can't move past it when it is applied. Uh, Mandea, let it be applied by way of fellowship. Let it be 
applied by way of rejoicing and acknowledging what he's done with it, how he's washed you, how he's cleansed you, how he's purified you, how he's purged you, how he's washed you with the water of regeneration, how he's given you access into his presence, how he's made you everything holy and acceptable unto him. For we thus judge if one died for all, then all are dead, that we should henceforth no longer live unto ourselves, but unto him who died for us and rose again. Therefore we now know no one after the flesh, though we knew Christ Jesus after the flesh. But if any man be in Christ Jesus, he's a new creation. So therefore, what Paul is saying there in verse 16 and 17, he's saying, all we know is the new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are new and all things are of God because we're swimming in the blood. We're drinking in the blood. We've got the fellowship of the body. Hallelujah. The body. Hallelujah. The body and the blood. I think I'm going to go to non bread. I got some non bread the other day. I thought, wow, this is good bread. This is good. This, guy, this is good communion bread. This is chewy. I like some substance. The cracker just falls apart. The, you know, the, the matzah just falls apart. It's just a mess. You know, the, the tortilla is pretty good, but it's just like, ah. It's not, it's just not, it's just too thin. I'm looking for something to chew on. Hallelujah. Something to delight my taste. Hallelujah. It's no, for it's no longer the bread of affliction, but it's the bread of liberation. <laughs> it's the blood of, woo, listen to me, it's the blood of freedom. I mean, I, I'm sorry. If you came tonight for a condemnation message, I'm sorry. You know, I, I've watched as people feast on condemnation. I was with some people the other day and you know, this, you know, and I was getting after it. Man, I was laying it down because people needed to lay it down. And there was this one person, they were just shouting. They were just so blessed. And, and, and you know, and I was, because I was given all the things that they really enjoy hearing, which you shouldn't really be enjoy hearing. You should be broken over hearing it. The next night, I just preached on nothing but mercy and love and, and his goodness. And they were all depressed with my message. And they should have been nothing but just rejoicing over that. It's kind of like upside down, you know. There's a call to repentance. There's a place where people need to recognize you need to fear God. The way to sin is death. But there's a gift of God that stands at the door. There's always a sin offering. I don't care how messed up you are. Cain. You know how you can tell Cain's? And this is going to depress some people, but get over it. I'm calling you to righteousness. Their countenance has fallen. What does it look like to have a fallen countenance? Are you with me? Everything's upside down. It's a frown. It's perplexed. It's distressed. It feels you, you're sulking. Unbelievable. 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 I worked hard for that offering. That's the best I had. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. God didn't accept it. Unbelievable. Have you had your unbelievable moments? I pray in the name of Jesus you don't have them anymore. That you get over in what God, the believable, what God has done for us. Come on, people. Man, when you start living this way, you can then walk on a, on a platform. And know that the thousands are going to be healed and saved. Because it's nothing about you anymore. People make it so much about themselves on the fundamental basis of their life and interaction with God. Therefore, they can never be used more by God. Because it's always all about them. You can walk into a nation and say, I'm meeting with the president. I need to pray for him. Well, dictator. <laughs> I need to pray for him because I don't want to live in heaven without him. We're setting it up. The meeting's being set up right now. I pray that you continually pray for Fidel Castro. The meeting is being set up between me and Fidel Castro. I mean, people walk around going, I don't have nothing to do. What on earth, man? You write involved you in, the, in, in earshot of, of revolutionary things. I mean, come on, people. What, are you bored? <laughs> you know, they sent me back my book to edit. Oh. I mean, it looked like the... the paper that I got in the third grade. I'm dead right now. <laughs> it looked like I had to start over. I said to the editor, you got to be kidding me. Is this a joke? She, she tells me, this is an amazing, great book. It's just I want it to be better. 
And I'm, I'm thinking, goodness, Chris, I said, I told my wife, I said, you know, after talking to her, she's, I know she's got a PhD because I mean, the, only those folks think like this. <laughs> so, and of course, I, I see this thing, and I'm like, my goodness. And oh, by the way, you've got two weeks. <laughs> and my book is completely so reorganized, I can't even recognize it. It's like, <laughs> Where is this stuff at? I look at the word count. All the word count's there, so it's all here somewhere. <laughs> now, fix it. <laughs> Make it flow. So, I mean, I lock into it. I just locked into it. I locked in. I got up yesterday morning. I got up at 7 o'clock in the morning, and, and it was 8 o'clock at night. And I said, I think I should stop. <laughs> this morning, I told Ann, you know, after, after I sit there, and it's like all of a sudden it's 3 o'clock, and she says she'd been talking to me, but I can't hear her, you know. I said, well, you know, it is a lot of work. But I get to preach to a lot of people. Because I got a bunch of folks that says, this is so good, they're going to go promote it. So uh, I'm going to do this. Listen, we can all, and, and that's just, that's, that's, a, that's a labor. Prayer, let's go to prayer. Pray, God, let's go to praise. Think about all we get to do and be and accomplish in prayer and praise. Because it's not about everybody else. Somebody said, I wrote a song, you should have been there, I should have recorded it, it could be a, ma a national hit, international. No, it wasn't for that. It was to bring you to a place of beholding him because people, if we can just behold him and get captivated by him, all of a sudden we won't be so big in our own eyes. We won't matter so much in our own eyes. All the things that we need to accomplish and do won't be in of interest or importance. Just, just getting to stare at him. And then he'll say, no, no, you got to go do this right now. Well, can I still stare at you while I do it? <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on, man. Come on, you're not that far away. You're not that far away. You want to sip away. You want to sip away from what I'm talking about here tonight. You want to sip away. You want to taste away. You want to bite away. You want broken body away. Just take it and begin to share it, begin to eat it, and begin to take a hold of this fellowship and this communion of this table, this wonderful access that we have by the blood of Jesus Christ, the same access that we have by the Holy Ghost. No blood, no Holy Ghost, no Holy Ghost, no blood. Try to frown a little bit longer. Just work on it. Work on it. Work on it. But people, Father wants to, He loves you. But you have to step out and say yes. He loves you. And all heaven's power and glory is available to you. I, I watch people, they just isolate themselves by all their doctrinal ideas, but their doctrinal ideas haven't gotten them anywhere. So what's, you've been believing it hadn't worked for you. Why don't you go ahead and change? Right. And we're talking about change tonight. Yeah. And I'm declaring to you the goodness, good news of God. I'm declaring to you the gospel of God. And you know what? We're going to have to step up and recognize the responsibility that we are the expression of what it means to be born again. And what does people think about that around you? Are they going, whoa, <laughs> no things? Are they, are they looking at you going, wow, there's something different about you. What's going on? I've got to know. I've got to understand this joy that you've got. You've got an amazing joy. This peace that you have. Come on, this wisdom that you have. This, come on, people. Father doesn't want us to be false witnesses. Go around telling people how we're part of the, you know, the redeemed, how we filled with the Holy Ghost, and we look like we've been dipped in, you know. <laughs> been, not fermented, not lemon juice, not fermented lemon juice, but vinegared lemon juice. I can't even imagine something worse. Soured, vinegared lemon juice. Not only dipped in it, smelling like it, and drinking it. Please. Come on. Father wants us to be pickled in something far better than that. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. There's therefore now no condemnation. Hallelujah. The offerer once purged has no more conscience of sin. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Ramanea. Just this place of acceptance in God, acceptance in the beloved, command to live out his life, command to be one with him, command to be holy, 
command to be righteous, command to be blessed with all spiritual blessing, commanded to be the temple of God, the dwelling place of Almighty, commanded to enjoy all these things richly that He's freely given to us. On and on and on the blessings and the commands and the promises and the goodness of God is now declared and extended to us, commanded to be in health. People ask me about divine health. I mean, you, you, they said, oh, can you prove divine health from the Bible? I'm like, are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? It's the very basis of the communion. It's the very basis of the fellowship. It's right there with being cleansed from your sin. If you don't believe that the blood cleanses you from your sin, you're not cleansed. If you don't believe that the communion also extends to healing your body, you're not going to be healed. But by his stripe, by his wounds, we were healed. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And that's not talking about some kind of spiritual healing. He's already dealt with the spiritual healing. Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. He bore our sin in his own body. Whew. Hallelujah. We take the bread and we recognize that the bread, the body of Christ Jesus literally took and absorbed all of the sin. It absorbed it all. It swallowed up the death. It absorbed it. God laid upon him the sins and the iniquity of us all. It absorbed all sin and all transgression for all all the way back to Adam, extending the mercy to whosoever will. God doesn't make anybody. He leaves everybody with a will. He didn't assign some to heaven and some to hell. He made it possible that the worst person that ever has ever lived, that could, has ever lived, could be set free. He, his body absorbed all of the sin of Abraham. It absorbed all of the sin of Moses. It absorbed all of the sin of Enoch. It absorbed because he was the sixth from Adam. And the sin passed upon him because of Adam's sin. It passed upon Enoch, even though Enoch pleased God. And God's taken him up into heaven and has reserved him there until a future day. Every human flesh will die. All human flesh will die. It is appointed, even Christ Jesus. That's how I know, one of the many reasons I know that Enoch's coming back as one of the two witnesses. He would say, well, it's Moses. Moses died. Somebody said that the Lord's going to resurrect him from the dead. Well, listen, I mean, come on. What's Enoch going to do? You just going to leave him there hanging? Give me a break. <laughs> Give me a break. Come on. Come on, man. He's a prophet that prophesied so radical in the midst of men's great iniquity. Men are going to great iniquity far beyond what it is now. People, this is just the warm-up stage. It's just warm-up stage. Surely it's what my book is about, The Final Two Kingdoms. I'm so, I'm so, I'm so blessed to be able to write it. And, and you know what happens? You start, you say you finally, you know, first I threw a little fit. Ha, 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 You know? And then all of a sudden the Lord said, well, just sit down. He loves us even when we're throwing fits. You know, kicking stuff. I wasn't kicking anything. Inside I was kicking. And now the richness of it's coming out and Father's make causing it to we're just that's much more potent. Huh? Just to show people where it's going. Show people where it's going. Show us how to get ready for the coming day. Praise God, we got more wisdom than the ants. Consider the ants, you sluggard. <laughs> Praise God, he gave us more wisdom than the ants. Know how to store up, know how to get ready for the coming events. For Jesus' blood absorbed it all. Jesus' body rather absorbed it all. Absorbed, absorbed all your sin. Today, it's the same because it's a miracle that's unchanging. It's the vicarious event of it. It's as though it's not limited to any space or time. It's ongoing. It's there. It's living. Uh, even though it's been, as it were, transferred into heaven and it's there before the throne of God right now, his blood still, it worked, it worked to be able to, at this very moment to absorb all of the sin. We take a hold of that body that was broken for us, as Jesus said, 
This is my body. It was broken for you. Take it. Eat it. Fellowship and commune with that which I've given. This is the true bread. This is the life. This is the living. This is how you're able to live through my death. You're able to live. Through my death, you're able to live. And how much more through my resurrection? Because, you know, when we're talking about communion, we talk about showing his death, but it's showing his death till he comes. So the reality of it is, is we're not just showing his death. We're showing his resurrection. And, our, and we're showing our watchfulness for his return. Hallelujah. I mean, you know, it would be fine if you need it. Just go ahead and fill you up a big old, uh, what do they call them? Big gulp full of grape juice. And walk around and just have communion all day long. Just sip all day long. Just sip. Just take another sip. <laughs> the reality of it is, it's going to be going on continually in our spirit, in our thinking. Thank you for your precious blood, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord, that you delivered me from sin, that you swallowed up death, that you broke the chains of hell, that you spoiled principalities and powers, that through this you made the smallest, youngest, littlest child in the kingdom of God mightier than Satan himself. Wow. The smallest, youngest, little child who puts their trust in the blood of Jesus that's been born for one, been born for one minute, born again for one minute, has the authority of Almighty God. Satan can't budge. He's paralyzed at their word. Amen. And then he goes to work to try to discredit the fellowship and the relationship and the blood and the experience and the authority to beat down the consciousness, the mindset, the thinking, the confidence, the boldness of it to ultimately handicap and imprison and limit the mature saints of God. Father, help us and praise God He is. It's about time people break free. Time to break free. I write unto you, brethren, that you sin not. This is where God's brought us. He's brought us to a glory realm. He's brought us to something that you can't even imagine what it looks like. It's an opportunity that goes beyond all that you could ever possibly think or ask. But if you sin, you have an advocate. You have someone who's helping you, who's on your side, who's taking up your part. And he's not trying to convince Father that you're a good guy. He provides his blood as a means of cleansing for anybody who says... Father, cleanse me if we confess our sins. He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The confession. <laughs> to confess it, to speak it out. Oh, God, forgive me. You know, James brings it to the point of confessing our faults one to another. Really, people, I'm going to tell you right now, you must understand what he's saying there. He's talking about where we have spoken evil against others. Where we in the body of Christ through ourselves are in such great need of forgiveness and mercy and have received it from God begin to now place slander and accusation and criticism and defamation upon others that are around us. Ah, oh, my goodness gracious. You need to confess it. Go to the person and say, forgive me. I did you wrong. I spoke evil against you. Huh? We're supposed to bless and curse not. And then he says, and you know, and he actually associates that with sickness. Do you understand me? Yes. And you know, if you all got all these theories about sickness, mine's based on the word. True. I'm just real clear on it. You know, I don't walk around wondering if I've done something wrong. You know what? If I thought I did, just go ahead and get it right and move on. True. Why stand around wondering it? Wondering. Forget about it. That's Satan's game. Just do what's right. If there's anything that comes to mind, just take care of it. Hallelujah. And besides that, God doesn't play no trickery games. He comes with a real clear speaking and says, you need to do this. Right. And you're like, boom, it hits you hard. Oh, yes, sir. I'm at fault. I'm wrong. Oh, God, I'll make it right. However, if you've been self-justifying, if you've been living in the shadows, if you've been practicing sin, if you've constantly been hardening your heart, it's hard to hear that. That's why we want purity. That's why we want worship. That's why we want praise. That's why we want the pure heart. The pure heart is always going to be transparent for, before God. There's nothing, here, there's nothing here that's hidden. I love that song. There's nothing here that's hidden. 
You are our one desire. Huh? Come on. Lord, our hearts are open. No, there's nothing here that's hidden. Lord, you're our one desire. You alone are holy. You, O oh God, are worthy. Let your fire fall now. I mean, I just, I, don't you just want to live in that? Yes. Don't you just want to live in that? Wouldn't it just be wonderful every time that you begin to stray and do something? Or begin to think about something and Satan begins to try to set you up with something because you're stupid. Everybody has moments of stupidity. Usually it's when you're not, usually it's when you're feeling somehow unwanted, unuseful, like a failure. God doesn't love you. You feel distant. Because if you feel so close, if you just stay close to Father, stay filled up with His love and His goodness, just knowing that you're right there in the center of all that his, all of his affections and his delights and his desires are centered around you, Satan didn't have a chance. He didn't have a chance. It's when you suddenly feel distant from God. But in those moments, all of a sudden, you start hearing those songs. God is holy and he's made me holy. God is righteous and he's made me righteous. God is almighty and I worship him alone. Huh? You alone are holy. You, O oh God, are worthy. Send your fire now. You know, a lot of what Paul says in, in Corinthians, and Corinthians um, chapter 11, you know, he just tells us, you know, when, he, when he's talking about don't eat the body and drink the blood unworthy. He's really, he's really dealing with people who just come in to get a meal. They're taking the sacred things and they're just running right over top of it. It is really, it's not sacred to them. They're just hungry. Hey, they got some drink and bread in. They got some food in here. We'll just hang out and have something to eat. It's eating and drinking the bread and the, bo the body and taking the body and the blood. in a wrong way, in an unsacred way. Just to, the most important thing about this table is the Lord wanting us to recognize our place of fellowship, that it's what it's all about. This is it. That's the table. It's the communion. Here it is. You want communion with God? It's as close as the blood. It's as near to your is your willingness to apply the blood. <laughs> People, there's, those of you who have reoccurring things going on in your life, there's a, if there's a claw in your life, a demonic claw in your life, repentance breaks it. People want to get delivered, and, and fine. You know, I, <laughs> I, put a hand, I put my hand the other night on a, a person in Vizawada, India. When I put my hand on him, I'm going to tell you, it was the wildest thing I ever felt because I felt as though the various different platelets that make up the various sections of the brain, it was. It was coming up and going down. No kidding. No kidding. It was like, a, it was like somebody took a, you can imagine it like this, a big bread roller, you know what I'm saying? And it was underneath his skull and it was rolling it back and forth. The demonic power was so distorting his head, his head was blowing out and coming back in. It wasn't my imagination, it was under my hand and I saw in my, it actually, it actually freaked me out. <laughs> and, I just, and I just stayed with it, I just stayed with it. You know, I just like, I want to get my hand off there, honestly. <laughs> but I stayed with it. And the next thing, pop, it's knocked out. He was the unreachable wild guy of the neighborhood of Izawada, in, in that region of Izawada. He, when he, he, was, he was listening to me preach. We were preaching outside, and they brought a company together, a lot, bit larger part of that neighborhood. And he was a wild guy who made fun of Jesus and blasphemed Jesus anytime anybody tried to talk about him. And all of a sudden, he began to scream out, Jesus is the true God in Hindi. Jesus is the true God. And he began to cry. He began to weep and wail. Help me. 
is crying out, help me. He was afraid even coming into the company and, and one of the men of God went over and, who went over and got him and, and he, was, he was all broken and busted up and he couldn't, you know, he couldn't even lift up his head. And I started to walk towards him and go, ah, oh, help me. And about that time, you could see it on our website, on my Facebook rather, Cade took a picture of him and you could see the, the, this, the intensity of this poor young man in his early 20s bound by the powers of darkness. It is so easy to be set free. He had no religion. He wanted no religion. He wanted no Christian religion. He wanted no Hindu religion. He wanted no religion. He only wanted to fight with people and get drunk and do immoral things. But the wonderful mercy and the grace of God that has been poured out because of the blood of Jesus Christ his blood was poured out not for our sins only, but for the sins of the whole world. The whole world. The whole world. The whole world is waiting to see a display of the power that only that precious blood can, can bring. He was knocked out on the ground. I went on praying for people. And, of course, we were, near a, a, it, we were in a rural area near a big field, and there was bugs everywhere because there had just been a rain. I mean, the bugs were thick. Ann was like, Ann hates bugs. <laughs> Here was a grace. I, didn't, I kept glancing over. I see no bug on him. All around him. You couldn't even see the white mat. The bugs were so thick there were no bugs on him. It's amazing. It's a beautiful thing. Beautiful thing. I'm going on praying for people. All of a sudden, sometime later, I don't know how long. Sometime later. Because when I'm praying for people, the night goes by. He got up. And he said, his face was glowing. His face was radiant. It's too bad that Cade well, didn't get her somebody to get a picture of him. I'm sure they did later. I'm sure he's in the church now. But that night, that moment, the contrast, he went from this vexed, tormented, demon-possessed young man to his face was radiant, and it was glowing and shining with the presence of the Lord. He, 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 had the, he had better doctrine than people who had been in seminary. He said, the devil went out of me, and Jesus has come into me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, this is the revelation that the Holy Ghost brings and somehow I don't know what happens to people that it becomes so aloof to them they become so distracted and, and because the strategies of Satan should not be able to work on us we should have care, no care for our own lives we should have no care to pursue our own stuff we shouldn't be comparing ourselves among each other there should be no room for discouragement because we can always turn and bless the Lord on my soul and forget not all of his benefits. Bless the Lord on my soul and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Forget not all of his benefits. Who daily loathes me with loving kindness and tender mercy. Come on, people. You're going to have to start thinking right. That's just all there is to it. You're just going to have to start thinking right. Hallelujah. We just gonna have to start thinking right. Praise God. It in it is Halabushikina Mahaya. Tonight as I serve you communion, I just want you to be healed in your body if you're sick. You know, on the night of Passover when they had the first communion, because Passover recognized the Passover is the first communion. It's the Lord showing us how he comes to deliver us. With mighty signs and wonders and miracles. Don't matter what's got a hold of you, he's coming at you. Ha! Hallelujah. And don't you worry about the devil that's destroying everybody else. You're going to be fine. Because <laughs> we're going to put the blood on you. True. And the lamb in you. Huh? Hallelujah. They put the blood on them that night. Hallelujah. Sat there eating the lamb. Praise God. Huh? What a night. What a night. And in the morning there was not one sick or feeble one among them. As they ate the lamb sitting there under the shelter. And the arch of the blood applied. Every part of their being was being touched by the power of God, and they were being uh, healed and changed and strengthened. Because they were getting ready to go on a journey. There was an encounter with God that night. You think about it. There was an encounter with God that night that caused their clothes and their shoes to last for 40 years. Hallelujah. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> think about it, man. You start living in the presence of God. I'm going to tell you, maybe Obadiah. 
actually lived more than 400 years because of an encounter. All of his house got blessed there. The ark was there. The glory started radiating here in his house. He's like got this sunbeam of divine power and glory in his living room. He's like, whoa, ho, 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 ho. come on, think about it. Think about what happened. David heard about Obedidim's house being blessed. So David was overwhelmed because of his best friend falling down dead because he tried to study the ark. God don't need no help. He don't need no balance. He don't need no steadying. Get your draw that meat hook in. <laughs> draw that lightning rod in before you struck down. Are you listening to me? God don't need no help. Just lift your hands and praise him. Hallelujah. You know, think about it. Think about it. You think about it. You think about it. Father can take care of his stuff. He need to hold up his ark, his throne. My goodness. Took leave of his senses. Took leave of his body, too, shortly thereafter. God's sacred things are sacred. Tonight, the blood is sacred. And it's been applied to our life. I'm painted with the blood. Can you see it? I'm marked with the blood. The 144,000 are going to be marked with the name of the Father in their forehead. Ain't no demon locust can touch them. No plague can touch them. Famine can't touch them. Hallelujah. The 144,000 that, that, that take up the ministry in the first part of the tribulation that then are replaced by the two witnesses, they go up, the two witnesses come. Boy, what a tag team. My goodness, and the two witnesses, five breathing prophets. Praise God, shut up heaven that it rain not. Bring the plagues of Egypt that God used against Egypt upon the people, the inhabitants of the land. What a ministry. What, and it's going to take that kind of a ministry because of the rebellious rebellion of men's heart. There'll be no men seeking God. Everybody will be defiant against God and rebels against God, following their leader and under the same demonized spirit as the Antichrist himself. But here we are tonight in a time and a moment where there's all the nation of the earth are hungry for Jesus tonight. It ain't there yet. We are, it's, a, it's a ways off yet. It's a ways off yet. Right now there's a great harvest. Right now this nation, the United States of America, needs to see Jesus. They're only going to see Jesus because there's a people who are washed in the blood of the Lamb and know it. Amen. Amen. There's a people that are washed in the blood of the Lamb and they know it. And when you're washed in the blood of the Lamb and you know it, you're excited. When you're washed in the blood of the Lamb and you know it, you have an access to be able to behold the glory. You're there in training and preparation to be presented before the Father in such a way that we are able to behold Him in all of His glory, even though we are His temple and He dwells in us now and He's taken up His dwelling place on the inside of us. Yet there is a face-to-face -face encounter. There is a revelation of Him. Paul said, I went up in heaven and I heard things and I saw things that I can't even tell you about. It's unlawful for me to declare it. What was that? What was that? My editor circled some things, you know, in the, in the text and said, tell us more. I'm like, I'm not going to. I'm going to keep it here. Halabokushiva. I'm not trying to draw attention to myself because I'm going to tell you right now, God gave me a gift, ability to speak the word. He gave me a gift, ability to understand the word and declare the word. He gave it to me a long time ago. He put it on me. Father chooses what he's going to put on us. You try to be like me on your own, just forget about it. You're going to be one frustrated person. Because I didn't get what I got on my own. It didn't come from man, it came from heaven. You need to get what God wants to give you. Hallelujah. Because God only describes the diversity of the body. Actually, only describes the body of Christ in the context of the gifts of the Spirit. Read it. The body of Christ is not even distinctive as the body of Christ without the manifestation of the Spirit. So he says, to one is given the word of wisdom, to another is given understanding, to another is given miracles, and it likens that unto the foot, to the hand, to the mouth, and frills it as the body of Christ. The activity, the power of Jesus being made manifest. Father, I thank you for putting a great anointing upon Tori in music to worship you, to be caught away with you. It is so easy to get caught away with ourselves and not in a good way. There, well, there are times we get, oh, we're proud of ourselves. We made an A. We're proud of ourselves. We rode the surfboard. We're proud of ourselves. We skied. We're proud of ourselves. Did you see me do it? Two hands. No hands, mother. 
We're proud of ourselves, but then we're equally just so upset with ourselves and discouraged with itself and disappointed with itself because we compared ourselves and we aren't making hardly any money, only making 85000 a year. <laughs> Person gets to a quarter million, I'm only making a quarter million a year because man is insatiable with lust, never squinched or satisfied. no value that does not mean anything tonight God the Holy Spirit will give you wisdom and understanding how to walk away from that realm how to live over here in Jesus looking under the altar and finish of our faith you know it's so perfectly set that jewel is so perfectly set in the midst of all the other splendor as it says looking unto him the author and finish of our faith who for the joy that was set before him. Endured the cross. Oh my God. I pray in Jesus' name that one day I might be able to communicate that in the depths of what I feel in God so that the lightnings of God will strike people's hearts and they can never be the same. We've got to come to a place where we communicate the gospel in a way where people in America, it's different in third world countries. They're more sensitive. But in America, people have heard so much. They've got teachers on the radio and teachers on the television and they've heard preaching all of their life and this preaching and that preaching and the other preaching and it's become anesthetized. Father's going to break through the thickness of it all. We're going to begin to understand something so glorious. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the Father. He finished it, sat down, having purged our sins with his own blood, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, expecting until his enemies be made his footstool. He's in the fight for us. He's fighting, he's the captain of our salvation. He's in the fight for us. The Lord is a warrior. He's girded his sword upon his side and he comes in and rides prosperously. Open up the gates and the King of Glory shall come in. Who is this King of Glory? The Lord, mighty in battle. Open up the gates of your heart and of your life. In this fellowship and this communion that was offered to us, and the King of Glory will come in. Who is the King of Glory? The Lord, strong in battle. Hallelujah. Open up the gates of your heart and the King of glory shall come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord. The leader of armies. Hmm. Who spoiled principalities and powers and might and dominion and everything that was against us and everything that stood testify against us and everything that stood to accuse us and everything that stood to slander us and everything that stood in contrary to our, our right to have relationship with him and he spoiled it he ruined it he took charge of it and he defeated it and describes to all the universe forever it is defeated your enemy is destroyed Everybody in this first section over here would just come. Thank you, Jesus. Just come. I love you so much, Chris. Love you, man. Bless you. Love you so much, dear. <laughs> Hallelujah. Live by the body and the blood. Say, just living by the body and the blood. Uh, just drinking the drinking the blood and eating the bread. 
This is the manna. Huh? Absolutely. That's right. Just talk to the Lord. You got a problem? Anybody or anything or anyone with the Lord? Just tell him. Say, Lord, forgive me. Uh, just say, Lord, strengthen me. I'll never do it again. You know, the beautiful thing about the, that the blood is the blood cleanses us. And the spirit of the Lord is there to strengthen us. Lord, thank you. So we say, Lord, forgive me. Thank you for cleansing me and washing me. And then we look to the Holy Ghost to strengthen us. Listen, dear, dear people, does, any, does it look like I have anything on me that looks like the world? Well, if there is, I want to get rid of it. I don't want to be marked by the world. I want to encourage you people, don't be marked by the world. If there's things in your house, in your life, that's of the world, that is of the demonic realm, get rid of it. Get rid of it. Get rid of it. If you know, if you've got, if you you know, got problems with your with your your computer or your iPhone, get rid of it. They still supply those regular phones that hook up to the uh, to the wall. I think. Last I heard. I love you so much, Carla. Get whatever it is. Get it out of your life. Father's looking for us to come in this fellowship and communion and be separated unto him and hey, it's good to see you. He's looking for us to be separated unto himself. How many of you tonight are standing here or sitting here in this place and you want to remain just like you are? then you're going to have to be willing to be different. And so then I, we talked to you tonight about, well, just how, this next section, just how different do you want to be? Just how different do you want to be? Do you want to be radically different? I mean, do you want to be radically different to where that in every dimension of you, baby? That in every dimension of your life, you're walking in the fullness of God? Well, then that's being conformed. What, who, for who? Oh, we're still working on her. Anna, do you know what this is, baby? Yes, it is, sweet darling. Hallelujah. And it was broken for you and me. What is this, Jude? What else is it besides bread? That is the obvious term. That's the obvious one. Okay, go. It's all right, Jude. We love you. It's just that, you know, it wasn't completely a total error. It's just, it's something else. You spoke the very obvious. It is the bread of life. Amen? And it represents the body of Christ Jesus. Don't be offended. Don't practice that at an early age. You have to spend a long time getting out of that habit. But God is so merciful and gracious to teach us, isn't he? God is so good. God is so good. Amen. Grace, I was so blessed to meet the people that you invited to church the other day. They, uh, a little culture shock, but praise God the seed was sown. Amen. They were attracted, they told me they were attracted to holiness. Grace came to talk to him about holiness. He thought, well, we want more. We don't, we don't want to understand more about holiness. I want to understand more about holiness. What is holiness? It's what you behold when you see Papa. You hear me? Oh, God. It's what we get to hold when we behold when we see Father. I'm set on seeing him. I'm set on seeing him. Everybody that has this hope purifies themselves just as he's pure. Do you hear me? Because God taught all of us to be perfect even as he's perfect. Somebody said, well, that just is a burden. No, it's an empowerment. How does he ever expect us to do that? Well, certainly not on your own. That's going to take some supernatural help. Are you listening to me? 
having begun in the spirit, are you made it perfect by your own ability? That should be a resounding loud shout. Let me help you again. Having begun in the spirit, are you made perfect? This is not a trick question. Having begun in the spirit, are you made perfect by your own human ability? Amen. Just get that now. Having been washed in the blood of the Lamb, you must be kept by the power of God. Hallelujah. How are you doing, buddy? That's good. It's good to see you. Bless you. How are you doing? How are you doing tonight? Are you doing good? Do you know what this is? You know what that is? Here, Pops. Hey, baby. Look at you. You're getting big, girl. How are you over there? You ready for a second try? So what is this? That's right. Amen. And what's that? What is that? Yeah, it is. Amen. I have no problem. I have no problem with children partaking of communion. I have no problem at all. I just, I just got it. I don't want them to ever. I would not want to be a part of developing anyone helping train anyone to be casual about what this is. This is our fellowship. This isn't a time for us to sob and cry. This is a time for us to rejoice. Somebody said, but we're supposed to be showing his death. Let's picture ourselves, you know, there at the cross. No, 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 no. We show his death till he comes. So we're showing his death while we're rejoicing in his coming. We're showing his death while we're rejoicing in the redemption applied. Sins washed away. <laughs> New life imparted. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he said, forget the whole thing. I'm turning him over to the devil. No. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he said, you know, I can't even believe there's no love around here. I'm leaving. I'm going to another church. I'm finding another company of people. I'm going to go over to the Indians in America. <laughs> well, we're supposed to be doing what he's doing. And if he's laid his life down for us, we are supposed to be laying our life down for the brethren. This is part of the fellowship because how can you say you love God whom you've not seen when you hate your brother you're not willing to fellowship with him? Yeah. Uh, come on now. How can, you, how can you be forgiven and not forgive? How can you be forgiven such a great debt and not forgive those that are around you? Come on, people. Let's make sure that everything's clean, everything's right. Let's make sure that we don't got a stream, trying to get a stream to come down from heaven for us when we're willing not to let the stream flow out of us. Amen. Come on now. Jesus said, I, I forgive you. The Lord said, I forgive you. Look at how God, many times God forgive you. Look at his mercy. I forgive you as many times as you need to forgive it. You know, he says seven times 70, but in the scripture, it is a description of an unlimited number. Whatever, whatever you need. It's, no more than, it's more than 490 times. Okay, let's say it's 490 times. That is an unlimited number. I have not asked the Lord to forgive me 490 times in a single day. But the Lord says it's there on one condition. You forgive others. You know, when he says to us and gives to us an open door of the greatest privilege that we could possibly have in fellowship, because it's the greatest, it is the greatest hallmark of fellowship is to be able to ask the Father whatever you will and he'll do it. To whatever you say, it will come to pass. Mark chapter 11, verses 23, 24. John chapter 15, verse 16. The fruit that God has purposed for us to bring forth. He, it, you look at how that Mark chapter 11, verses 23, 24 is couched right there in the Lord saying, now, if somebody is trespassed against you, you forgive them. Huh? 
there's a fence you forgive him. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he said, I'm going to give myself for you. On the night that Jesus was betrayed and should have been offended and should have walked out saying, these people don't care about nothing. They have no, no value of the sacred. They don't recognize my anointing and my gifting. They have no honor for the prophet. All the stuff. Are you with me? I'm making my point? Don't have that stuff going on in your life because that's nonsense. On the night that he was betrayed. Have you ever felt like you betrayed Jesus? I have. And there he's breaking his bread for me. To bring you tears, to break you, and bust you. When you're not, when you don't, when Satan can't take you prisoner in his condemnation, and you're a cap, you're captivated by the author and finisher of your faith who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross despising the shame and sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high and expecting until his enemies be made a footstool for after that he purged out of sin hallelujah he who upholdeth all things by the word of his power on the night that he was betrayed he took bread and he broke it and he said this is my body which is broken for you I'm giving it for you. This is the true bread. Moses did not give you the true bread. I give you the true bread. He that eats my flesh and drinks my blood is the one that dwells in me. He that eats my flesh and drinks my blood are the same as he that receives his fellowship with me has eternal life. And this is the token of it. And Father, we thank you so much for the bread of life, for the bread of heaven. Bread of heaven, feed me till I want no more. Feed me. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Jesus' name be healed. My Savior, my Master. Oh, God. I'm living forever. We're on our way to a very good place. Very soon, I shall put off this tabernacle. Very soon, I will look and back on my body, laying somewhere. Hopefully, I'm in a pulpit somewhere, preaching. I'm laying by the pulpit, and everybody's all concerned around me. And I'm going to say goodbye to my body. I'm really probably not going to say much to my body. So I'm be captivated by the one who's coming to get me. Jesus said, I go away to prepare a place for you, and I will return again to receive you into myself. I take that as a personal promise from the Father that Jesus is going to come get me. Wow. I plan on living close enough to Him that before I breathe out my last breath, I'm able to actually see Him. I'm planning on seeing Him before then. I'm planning on stepping into the greater works. I'm pursuing a place in Father of beholding His glory and walking in His in His majesty. And it's all by the blood. It's all by the bread. It's all by the fellowship. It's all by the communion. It's all, it's all the realm of faith. Enoch was able to do what he did because he was willing to step into faith. He was able to see what he saw because he was willing to step into faith. He was able to go where he went because he was willing to step into faith. And the same is for you and I. And that faith, that faith is nurtured and developed and brought forth and blossoms by communion. And after that, he had eaten. After that, he had eaten. He took the cup. He said, this is the new covenant. <laughs> An ongoing, eternal, everlasting, never decaying and never fading away and never losing its power. New covenant. In my blood, is given to you to wash away to remove to remit to blot out to cancel to destroy to put to death to put away to lift off of you all sin I grant to you this office says this forgiveness in my blood this is that blood which will continually wash you and cleanse you because you walk with me and on that day, I'm going to tell you right now, on that day, on that day, we may have been in 
I may have been in glory for two, three hundred years. There'll be some people that have been in glory for two, three thousand. But on that day, when he takes a hold of the book and he begins to unloose the seals, when he begins to take a hold of the book, we're going to say, unto you alone, you alone are worthy. You have washed us and loosed us from our sins in our own blood. Every crown will come off from everyone's head. I don't care how many crowns you've got. You may have received all five crowns. The martyr's crown, the crown of righteousness, the crown of life, faith, not away. You may have received all the crowns. They'll come off your head. Father may have given you one of the highest positions in the kingdom. You'll gravel in the dirt just like everyone else, so to speak. But there'll be nothing on you worthy to stand before his presence. For he alone has washed us. We see nothing valuable in ourselves except for him. We see no righteousness except for his. No holiness except for his. No power except for his. Our cleansing, our washing, our life, our being in him and him alone. There is no hope outside of Jesus, for there is no other name given under heaven whereby men can be saved because there's no one who poured out his life and soul unto death who was not under the power of death. There was no other one who could redeem us from the power of sin and Satan except for God himself. And so he did so. And tonight, once again, we drink the blood of Almighty God. That which represents the blood of Almighty God who became a servant, who became flesh to die for us. As a testimony of that which we've been cleansed by and means of our fellowship, the sweet sweet taste of communion ah, the cup of rejoicing hallelujah yummy how sweet no bitterness in it no leaven in it no pollution of alcohol no bacchus in it no death in the cup. No demon in the glass. No foul spirit to contaminate that which God has made holy. But nothing but the fruit of the vine. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Sweet. Sweet. Hallelujah. Sikora masilia prataha. Hallelujah. Everybody, would you stand with me? Say this after me. Say, Father, Father we dedicate ourselves ourself to, to walk with you, to walk in purity, to purify ourselves even as you're pure, pure. to walk in holiness, to be holy even as you're holy, to walk in perfection. To be perfect even as you are perfect. To walk as you are. Because in this earth, right now as your church, we live as you live. We are as you are. Thank you for this oneness. Thank you for this power and this authority. Thank you for this strength and ability to be completely separate from everything that is demonic, that belongs to sin, that belongs to this world, that belongs to the realms of unrighteousness. We're yours, Lord. We recognize that we were purchased by you. We are not going to deny that you bought us. We are not our own. We're yours. Thank you. Hallelujah. Find a bunch.
touch the people around you, hug them, tell them that you love them. Give yourself to seeking God. Hunger, and you shall be fed. Thirst, and he shall give you to drink. Pursue, and you shall find. Seek, God will give you all those things that he himself has commanded you to have. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Every sickness, every disease, every lying power of condemnation and unbelief, I break your power now in Jesus' name. Perhaps you're watching us on the web right now or, or on a YouTube. <laughs> and you've never called upon the name of the, of the Lord Jesus Christ. You've never given yourself over to the living God. Maybe you have, but you've, been, you've grown cold and indifferent. You got involved in sin and your heart became calloused against God. Satan was able to move in and produce all kinds of doubt in your heart. Cause you to become insensitive to the reality and presence of God. Right now, there's the opportunity for you to be set free. Father, is there right now, sitting right where you're sitting, standing right where you're standing. He's right there where you are. Christ Jesus is knocking at the door of your heart. What he said 2,000 years ago to the church in the book of Revelation is just as real today in this moment. He stands at the door of your heart knocking. If anybody will open up, if anyone will respond, if anyone will call upon the name of Jesus, if anyone will say, God, I've got to have you in my life. I turn myself back over to you, Father God. I surrender to you. Take control of me. Take hold of my life. He'll answer your prayer. Everything will change. I command in Jesus' name. Satan takes his hand off your life right now. The power of God takes hold of you in Jesus' name. 